Good afternoon, everybody. It's now 12 o'clock. Welcome to this webinar on climate change and sustainable construction. Uh, shortly, we will be receiving a presentation from three of my colleagues, uh, Alice Barnes, Celine Houghton and Richard Theone. Um, my name is Mark Hayward. I'm a community engagement officer for the council and I'm here just to ensure that uh, this webinar is chaired uh, correctly today. And uh, I'm delighted to be able to welcome our cabinet member for planning and licensing, Councillor Tim Ball, who would like to say a few words before we move on to our presentation. I'd just like to remind you that if you have any questions throughout the presentations today, please use our question and answers function and we'll collect those up and uh, we will uh, be addressing those once the presentation has been completed. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. The Council is updating its planning policy framework in order to better address the key priorities of the Council, in particular the climate and ecological emergencies. We're updating parts of our core strategy of placemaking plan, the local plan parcel update, preparing three supplementary planning documents on transport, development, house and multiple occupation, and energy efficiency, retrofitting, and sustainable construction. As part of our commitment to giving people a bigger say, we published on the 27th of August these draft documents for consultation. It's really important you take this opportunity to submit your comments, which will be carefully considered and will help influence our policies. The updated policies are crucial as they will help shape the future development and change in our area. Today's session is one of a series of webinars that we've arranged in order to explain some of the key policy updates and changes and to outline how you can engage in the process and submit your comments. It's also opportunity to ask questions of our officers to help inform your responses. I'll hand over to the officers to introduce themselves. Okay, over to Alice then. Right, morning everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm Richard Dayone. Uh, I manage the, the planning policy team. Uh, so I'm going to just introduce the presentation and I'll, I'll be handing over to my uh, colleagues, uh, Alice Barnes and uh, Celine Horton. So if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. So really, just before we get into the, the sort of meat of the presentation, just really a, a general reminder that in the UK, we operate something called a, a plan-led uh, planning system uh, and that means that planning decisions on uh, planning applications must be taken in accordance with the development plan or, or the local plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. So that's really just emphasizing the importance of making sure uh, our policies in our, in our local plan are up to date. Uh, in terms of Bath North East Somerset, uh, our current development plan is, is made up of a number of documents. So chiefly, it's really the local plan, which is comprises the core strategy and the placemaking plan, and also uh, a series of neighborhood plans where those have been uh, made or adopted for different parts of the uh, district. Uh, and then just to note that alongside the local plan, the council prepares uh, a range of supplementary planning documents, uh, which really set out more detail, more supporting information on uh, how particular policies uh, will operate. Next slide, please. So just a, a, a reminder here, just to in, in case people aren't aware, uh, we're currently out to consultation uh, on four um, documents uh, and the consultation closes on the 8th of October. So you've still got pretty much a month to get comments to us. And, and uh, as Councillor Tim Ball said, we would very much encourage you uh, to respond to the consultation. It's very important in terms of uh, helping the council uh, shape its uh, policy framework. So the four documents are uh, the local plan partial update, which we'll come on to uh, in more detail in a moment. Uh, also the energy efficiency, retrofitting and sustainable construction supplementary document, again, which we'll be talking about today. And then two other supplementary documents, which uh, have already been the subject of uh, separate webinars on transport and development and houses in multiple occupation. Uh, and whilst those webinars have already taken place, you can actually view uh, those webinars on, on the council's YouTube channel. 
Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of um, the topic today, we are, as we've already said, focusing on uh, climate change policies. Uh, and I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, Alice Barnes, to take us through that. My name's Alice Barnes, and uh, I'm Planning Policy Officer, and one of my jobs is to progress the Council's policies on sustainable construction. So as we all know, Bath and North East Somerset Council has declared a climate emergency with the aim to be carbon neutral by 2030. And I'm sure you've also seen in the news, um, there's been a recent report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which has advised that the cuts and emissions can be stabilised, right? We can stabilise rising temperatures, but that action must be taken now. And the past five years have been the hottest on record. So in terms of the climate emergency, the council have identified three priority areas which they wish to address. And this is the energy efficiency of buildings, transport and local renewable energy. And in this presentation, we're going to focus on uh, the energy efficiency of buildings. So how do we address the climate emergency through planning policy? Um, so as Richard says, we're currently progressing the local plan partial update and supplementary planning documents. So in this presentation, we're going to focus on our emerging planning policy and how we're addressing these priority areas. So we're going to look mainly at zero carbon construction policy in the local plan partial update. And then my colleague Celine will take you through the council's supplementary planning document on energy efficiency and retrofitting. Uh, as Richard said, we also have policies in the partial update on EV charging and renewable energy, and there has been a previous uh, webinar on um, uh, transport, and I'd urge you to go to YouTube and watch that if you're interested. So looking at our current situation, um, we have a couple of sustainable construction policies that are currently adopted in our framework. Um, these were adopted through the core strategy and the placemaking plan, which is in 2014 and 2017. So we've got two policies at the moment. We have SCR1, which is our on-site renewable energy requirement, and CP2, which is our sustainable construction policy. Both these policies are underpinned by a sustainable construction checklist, uh, which is the detail, which is where developers will su submit details of how they are implementing the policy. So at the moment, our policy framework allows us to require a 19% carbon reduction from building regulations of the overall emissions, and 10% of that can come from renewables. And for minor development, we can again ask for a 19% reduction. And for medium and major existing building um, conversions, we can require a 10% reduction. Uh, and then just to give you a quick update on where we are in terms of national policy, so you may be aware that the government has recently, well, back in January, closed their uh, consultation on the future home standards. So for those that don't know, the future home standard is a proposal to um, change building regulations to require improved fabric standards and therefore require carbon reductions through building regulations. So uh, the consultation response was uh, released in January. And it, the intention is, is that um, by 2025, uh, an 80% carbon reduction in new buildings will be required. However, the government is proposing an interim uh, reduction, which will be a 31% carbon reduction, which they intend to bring in by 2022. Now, as yet, we know that they want to bring in this interim reduction, but we don't yet know how they're proposing to achieve that, be it through fabric standards, air force, heat pumps, et cetera. Um, we've also got the future building standard, which relates to non-residential buildings. That's running slightly slower, uh, slightly later than the future home standard. And that will, uh, again, re change building regulations to require carbon reductions in non-residential buildings. So the main point to note from this consultation is that local authorities can still set their own uh, carbon reduction standards. So we still have the power to set um, zero carbon construction policies. So what are we proposing? So for residential buildings, as I've said, we um, don't yet know how the future home standards will exactly work. Um, but we do know that it's going to involve a change to building regulations and that building regulations are likely to change at least twice in the coming, in the coming years. And therefore, if we uh, proposed a policy that related to the carbon reduction of, from building regulations, which is what we have at the moment, we'd have to update it um, quite a lot because we know the building regulations will change and we don't yet know how they will change. And therefore, we're proposing to change our metric as to how we uh, measure zero carbon. And therefore, we'll basically be measuring zero carbon by setting parameters 
for two things, which is space heating, which is the energy used specifically for the heating of a building, and energy use intensity, which is the predicted total energy use. And then we will be seeking that uh, the energy use is met through the provision of on-site renewable energy with the preference for solar panels. Um, this is an approach that's been championed by national organisations such as the London Energy Transport Initiative and the UK Green Building Council. Um, it's also an approach that's been taken up by other local authorities such as uh, Cornwall and Cotswold Council. Um, there's quite a lot of advantages to taking this metric forward. It's much easier to understand and it's going to be easier for our planning officers to be able to calculate um, the carbon reductions. And also it's going to be very easy for us to update it. Um, so say in a couple of years time in the new local plan, we'll be able to lower the parameters again as evidence base moves on and the grid continues to decarbonize. Um, and it also doesn't um, set a requirement for a particular technology. Um, so developers will have a bit of flexibility to choose the appropriate technology to their development. So for non-residential buildings, as I've said, the future building standards consultation is currently running sort of slower than the future home standard consultation. So we really don't yet know what the requirements of that are going to be. Um, in the case of non-residential buildings, the metric we're proposing for residential buildings uh, would be much harder to set on those residential buildings. Um, this is because non-residential buildings very wildly in their sort of design and their use you know, an office and a school fun all function in very different ways. Um, and therefore, in this case, we are going to stick with building regulations to calculate our um, carbon reduction. So what we're going to require is a 100% uh, reduction in carbon from building regulations. And we're going to use a hierarchy of how we want that to be achieved. So we want uh, fabric uh, to be improved as much as possible first, and then energy standards to be met through renewable energy. And then for major developments, we do have the power to ask for any carbon that can't be mitigated on site to be offset through a financial contribution. And then we're also proposing a policy on embodied carbon. Um, so embodied carbon is uh, the carbon emissions resulting from the building materials, construction and use of the building over its lifetime, including demolition and disposal. Um, it's a policy that has been introduced by the Greater London authorities in the Greater London Plan and the West of England authorities as a whole are currently pursuing to update our evidence base to support um, the uh, requirement for embodied carbon assessments. So at present, um, we are just proposing, in terms of viability, we're going to set a cost neutral policy, which would require the assessments uh, just on large scale development. So that would be anything from 50 dwellings and above. And the policy will be set above the industry standard and therefore it will be, um, it shouldn't cost any more to meet this policy. And there's also already a lot of online tools that can be used to um, conduct these assessments, such as through the UK Green Building Council and I think uh, RICS as well. Um, and then what we intend to do is use these assessments um, as part of our evidence for the new local plan. So in a couple of years time, again, technology will move on the grid will decarbonize and we expect that we will be able to then set a lower parameter again in policy terms. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Celine, who's going to take you through our subcurrent youth planning documents. Hello, so I, uh, I'm Celine, I'm a planning policy officer. So as you may be aware, the council has existing guidance in relation to energy efficiency, renewable energy, sustainable construction and retrofitting. And this is set out separately in two supplementary planning documents, which were published in 2013. So both documents aim to set out how changes and adaptions can be made um, to buildings in response to climate change whilst also having regard to the statutory legislation. So in response to the Council's climate emergency declaration in 2019, it was decided that the SBD should be reviewed, updated and combined into one clear and user-friendly document where the reader will be able to find uh, all of the information in relation to um, the energy efficiency in homes in one document. Um, so you can see the new SBD uh, on the right hand side of the page. So next slide, please. So in summary, we've reviewed and updated seven key areas, which uh, include reviewing and updating the wording, combining the SBDs, 
um, creating a website format which is available in addition to the PDF version of the document, um, updating the presentation, including the format, the illustrations and the photos, um, updating the technical information, um, updating the policy wording and um, also adding a new section which will address affordable warmth. Um, next slide, please. So the first element of the review was um, updating the wording. So some elements of the original SBDs were um, interpreted as being unnecessarily negative in parts with quite limiting in interpretations of the policy and guidance. So to better address the climate emergency in the new SBD, where possible, there's been um, a significant shift in the tone and the language of the SBD so that the guidance is more encouraging um, and enabling to the reader. So one way this has been achieved is, be, is, is uh, by making some significant changes to the policy wording um, to provide a more proactive approach to heritage assets. Um, we now um, emphasize the positive mitigation measures that would allow certain retrofitting measures um, and sustainable construction pra practices to be considered acceptable instead of simply stating what you can and can't do. Um, and we've also included a new practical quick wins checklist. Um, next slide, please. So another major part of the review has been um, combining the two original SBDs um, into one user-friendly document. So in the new SBD, you'll be able to find information um, for all building types, um, including heritage assets in one place. So here uh, I'll take you through an example of how we've amalgamated the original SBDs. So um, you can see the two original SBDs on the screen. Uh, if you go to the next page, um, please. So in the new SBD, each me measure is accompanied with an illustration and or a photograph um, of the retrofitting measure. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, the SPD will then take you through what the measure is, how effective it is, what does it cost, um, any potential guidelines to improve efficiency and also any issues to be aware of. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, and then you'll also be able to find all of the information which is only relevant to heritage assets, including if building consent is required, um, uh, any guidelines, um, which will help you implement the, the retrofitting measure um, and get, th get it through the planning system. Um, and then at the end of the page, we've included a further guidance box. So we've used this same consistent format um, for all of the retrofitting measures in the SBD to make um, the information as uh, clear um, uh, to um, the reader as possible. So if you go to the next slide, so another part of the review has been creating a website format of the SBD, which um, is available in addition to the PDF version of the document. Um, so the main benefit of the website format of the SBD is that it improves accessibility um, and will hopefully increase engagement with the information. So in terms of the format, um, the idea is that you'll be able to click on and expand the various chapters and headings in the SBD um, to take you straight to the information that you want. Um, the website version of the SBD is also more interactive um, and it includes built in links. Um, it's also compatible with um, phones and, and iPads. Um, and also um, different screen readers, which means that you'll be able to access the information when out and about. And you'll also be able to zoom into the different um, images and the text. Um, next slide, please. So we've also um, updated um, the presentation. So like I mentioned earlier, each um, sustainable intervention is now accompanied with an illustration and or a photograph. So all of the images are now technically up to date. We've also included more up close um, and cross sectional um, illustrations, which show how to correctly implement the different measures into the building fabric. And also uh, they help to illustrate how the different retrofitting measures work within the building. Um, next slide, please. So all of the technical information um, has been reviewed and is now um, up to date. 
So we've um, added brand new technologies to the new SBD. We've also included more information on the various preventative measures that people should take to avoid any potential unintended consequences of retrofitting um, and where uh, in some cases, further professional advice may be necessary. So for example, the new SBD includes information on how to um, correctly undertake different fabric improvements, um, seal the building envelope, um, and also ventilate buildings in order to prevent potential issues such as damp, mold, and interstitial condensation. So next slide, please. We've also reviewed and updated the policy um, to reflect the, um, the most up-to-date national and local policy context. So um, as I've mentioned, the SBD now clearly promotes existing rights to encourage more retrofits. And we've also made some significant changes to the policy wording um, in order to facilitate a more proactive approach, uh, particularly with regards to heritage assets. Um, so next slide, please. And then finally, we've added a brand new chapter which will address affordable warmth, including information on what affordable warmth is, who uh, this, this information applies to, um, as well as some of the potential solutions and grant schemes which are available. So if you go to the next slide. So in terms of the remaining programme stages, as Richard mentions, uh, the current consultation um, will take place until the 8th of October. We'll then consider the issues and comments raised uh, and make any revisions to the SBD between October and December. Um, the SBD uh, will then be approved by the Council in early 2022, and it's anticipated that the final version of the document will be um, available and published uh, also in early 2022. So I'll now hand you back over to uh, my colleague Richard. So yeah, thank you to, to Alice and Celine for, for taking us through uh, the emerging uh, and the proposed policy framework and the SBD, very helpful. Um, in terms of just a reminder again, the consultation period closes on the 8th of October. Uh, there's on that slide, uh, the link to the website uh, consultation where all the documents can be accessed as well as um, the online response portal uh, and, the, and the web form. So what we've tried to do there is we've, we've designed what we think and what we should should be a, a, an easy to use uh, response portal for you to be able to submit your comments and that's the best way uh, to submit comments and it helps to make sure that they're directed to the right uh, part of the consultation but clearly we understand not everybody's got access to a computer so uh, respondents can also send in uh, paper copy comments uh, and obviously what we're really, really encouraging residents, communities and, and other stakeholders to do is to actually, you know, look at the documents and, and respond to them, as I've said, to help us shape uh, the policy framework in, in the future. Um, we've held a series of events of which this is one, both virtual briefings and webinars. We just want to go on to the next slide, please. So that's just a, a program of the webinars you'll see. Uh, you know, most of those have now taken place, but as we've already said, uh, those are available on the Council's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and after today's webinar, there's one more uh, on the local plan partial update uh, more generally. Uh, if, you want to take, uh, if you want to receive any more information or you have any queries about how to comment, uh, then you can email us at the uh, email address at the bottom of, of that slide. So. That concludes the presentation. We've left plenty of time uh, for questions because we're anticipating there'll be a lot of interest in terms of this topic area. So, so expecting a lot of questions. Um, just to say, in addition to myself, Celine and Alice, we've been joined uh, by two colleagues, uh, Paula Freeland and Adrian Nielsen from the planning and conservation team. So they'll be able to uh, help answer questions around listed buildings uh, and undesignated historic buildings as well. So without further ado, I think we'll hand it over to questions and my colleague, uh, George Blanchard, will, will look at the questions as they come in uh, and ask those of the panel. So if you've got any questions, 
Uh, now's the moment, really, to start putting those into the uh, Q&A function. Pre-written questions as well, so anyone's that come in before the uh, webinar started. So um, just on the zero carbon policy, uh, there's a question around uh, how have the standards been set? Um, so the standards have uh, originated from research by national organisations, I think I touched upon this in the presentation, uh, organisations such as the London Energy Transport Initiative and the UK Green Building, Building Council have done research and kind of uh, ascertained that the metrics we're proposing are going to be um, a better way of uh, judging zero carbon construction. Uh, and also it's something that's now being taken forward by other local authorities as well. So, uh, a question on Part L. Uh, please can you clarify what 100% reduction in Part L for non residential buildings means? Um, so, basically, uh, Part L sets the baseline standard for fabric requirements in a building. And what we would be looking for is the, uh, the fabric of the building to reduce the um, the um, regulated energy by 100%. Um, and so that would be backed up. We have a sustainable construction checklist on our website and we will have to probably tweak, tweak that slightly. Um, and it's uh, done through all the um, details that people give through the sustainable construction checklist. So um, there's what's called the dwelling emission rate and the target emission rate. And the target emission rate has to be a 100% reduction from the dwelling emission rate. So another one here, um, how does the zero carbon policies affect the viability of, of the development? Um, so we, um, as a whole, the local plan partial update is looked at through viability testing. And um, so what we've done as part of the draft is the draft has been tested, they've looked at the viability of the plan as the whole. So all the things that you ask for in a local plan, be it biodiversity, net gain, zero carbon, et cetera, that is looked at as the overall development. And so the viability is checked before the plan um, was published. Um, so we've looked at um, the costs of implementing these measures and we consider them to, um, to be viable. Thanks, Alice. If I can just add, add to that, um, people may or may not be aware that the local plan will be tested uh, at examination by a planning inspector and uh, it's test against uh, what are called soundness tests. And one of those is, is the plan uh, effective, which basically means, it, is it deliverable? Uh, and one of the key tests on that, as Alice has outlined, is, is, is viability. We have to be able to show that all of the policies and the policy requirements uh, which we're placing upon development don't render that development uh, financially unviable. So again, as Alice has said, the cost of uh, the various sort of zero carbon measures uh, has been fed into that overall viability approach. And at this stage, uh, as I say, the testing we've done so far, that is, that is showing for the vast majority of different types of development across uh, the district that uh, the zero carbon policies alongside all of the other policy requirements that that, uh, that that is financially viable. So we are we are confident on that. But again, uh, in making comments on the partial update, those comments uh, need to address whether respondents feel our plan is sound. Uh, and therefore, that may be an area uh, that respondents want to look at in terms of uh, our evidence base and, and their opinions on that on that matter. Okay, so uh, a couple of questions coming in. Uh, please, can you say a bit more about what energy efficient standards new residential will have to comply to? Um, so in our sort of, uh, previous policies and the current policies, we would look at uh, fabric efficiency first. Um, so it's basically looking at um, how you can kind of retain heat within the building. Um, so you don't end up with, I think it's called like cold bridges where you, you know, if you, if you put your hand against a window, you can feel it's very cold there. So you would look at um, 
sort of changes to windows and sort of double glazing, triple glazing, etc. And also sort of looking at like the air tightness of the building. <clears throat> so um, essentially it's sort of, um, you don't need so much energy to heat the building and you don't need so much energy to sort of use the building essentially. Um, I don't know if any of my comment, my colleagues who worked on sustainable construction um, SPD have got any further comments. I don't have any further comments, no. Yeah. Uh, so another one, is, is the council doing anything to make residential retrofitting and upgrade more affordable for the homeowner? Um, oh, sorry, Steve. Uh, no, I was just going to say that it, in the SPD, the, we do actually reference um, a few of the different grant schemes that, which are available. Um, these are available through the, the government, um, but I'm, I'm I'm not sure if um, maybe Alice or Richard could um, answer if the, the council specifically are um, uh, providing any um, potential schemes to make the retrofitting more affordable to the homeowner. I think that's something we could look into more, but I would direct you to the council website. I think this morning there was a new story about how the council are looking at how um, renewable energy, solar panels and things like that can be purchased on more like a group basis to, to try and make it cheaper. So I think um, council wide, there is sort of, it is, sort of, they are aware of that. And I'd say just have a look on the council website this morning. I think there is a new story on that. Yeah, and just to, just to add to that again, um, the council runs a, a homes energy uh, project, which does include information on, as, as Selena said, the grants that are available as well as uh, other practical help, uh, particularly for those on, on, on lower incomes to retrofit these measures. So I'd recommend uh, very much going on that part of the council website um, and, and looking at the information there. Okay, so another question here on the um, SPD. Will track four in the current sustainable checklist for certified passive house design the routine in the SPD? Oh, that's actually, um, that's one of the tracks in the sustainable construction checklist. Um, we will be reviewing the checklist um, as the plan progresses towards adoption. Um, and yeah, that's certainly something that we'll consider retaining is the passive house exemption. Uh, how will the emergency policy specifically address the conversion of existing buildings through PD, uh, particular, so that's domestic development, particularly if the orientation of the existing building is not optimal for state of house. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, we can only um, control what requires planning permission through planning through our planning policies. So it will be difficult when it's a uh, permitted development for us to um, require these measures. However, that's kind of why we also have the supplementary planning document as well, because um, that is a lot of things you can do to a building without requiring planning permission. Yeah, exactly. And just to, again, supplement what people have said that that's the whole purpose of the SPD is to provide that really positive, helpful and, and clear advice on those measures that can be retrofitted to uh, existing buildings. So again, we recommend um, that people read, read the SPD and, and Again, get us our views on that. So one on heritage uh, assets now. So is the council working with other cities that have heritage assets to get the list of building restrictions eased so heritage assets can become more energy efficient? The council is focusing on really is, um, you know, updating the SPD so that that provides um, you know, more facilitative and more, more positive guidance in terms of what, what types of measures uh, could potentially be fitted to uh, different types of, of, of listed buildings, because you've got to remember with listed and indeed undesignated historic buildings, it's not a one size uh, fits all, you've very much got to fit uh, the right type of measure to the right type of building, and that's um, something that, that the council's conservation team can, can provide uh, guidance on. I don't know whether Paula or Adrian want to, to come back on the, the sort of first part of the question. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, so we, no, we're not, not working with other councils, other authorities to 
uh, ease restrictions, as you as you refer to. Um, I mean, the 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 legislative uh, framework and the policy framework remains the same throughout the country. Um, but you know, we, as many other authorities are doing, is that we're um, looking very positively at uh, improving the energy efficiency of historic buildings. And for, we've been doing it for years, to be honest with you, in, in our daily work, work you know, um, dealing with listed buildings and listed building applications. So we're, we're already doing it. Um, and in fact, the, the advice and the, the guidance that we're producing um, it can kind of clear, clearly sets out the approach that we advocate and the approach that we advise um, building owners to take. So we're, we're already doing it. You know, really, that's we've already been very positive and proactive in in uh, trying to achieve uh, energy efficiency for traditional buildings, listed or otherwise. Paul, I think, would you are you okay with that? Do you, do you want to comment any more? Yeah, only to only perhaps to say that we we do keep in touch nationally with what's happening in in other authorities across the country. So we're aware of of um, opportunities that have been taken elsewhere as well. So working with colleagues across uh, nationally. But no, as, as Adrian and as Richard have said, we're, we're, we're looking through the SPD to look at how we can positively um, allow opportunities for improving energy efficiency to listed buildings. So there's just one question open um, a moment ago. It's, uh, what nationally recognised standard are you to referring to from the plan? I guess that's for the plan. Uh, um, if that's in the case of uh, carbon reduction, uh, we are looking, at the moment, we use what's called the standard assessment procedure, which is, um, it's abbreviated to SAT, and it's sort of a widely used standard for calculating carbon reduction. We are also looking at what's called PHPP, which is more um, a standard set by the Passive House Trust. Um, so we are considering of maybe using that as well. Um, and that is something that will outline in the sustainable construction checklist. Just wait and see if any more questions come in. Okay, just to encourage everybody, if there's anybody watching there that, that's still got a question they want answered to uh, submit it now. It, it may be that there aren't that many questions coming in this morning because we've we already you know held uh, two or three webinars with a, a number of different stakeholders in preparing the SPD and discussed and answered probably a number of the questions uh, through those events. Um, as is, as George says, we'll, we'll wait a minute or so to see if any uh, further questions come in. So it doesn't look like we're going to get any more uh, questions this morning. So uh, thank you to everybody that has been watching. Actually, no, I, I can see a couple of a couple of questions have come in as, as I say that. So, George, do you want to uh, take us through those? Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, question one at the top is, is the council considering measures for tackling overheating in light of anticipated hot summers? Um, yes, we are. Um, so at the moment, we in our sustainable construction checklist, we do have a section in there specifically on overheating and orientation. And for larger buildings, we already require what's called a SIBSI assessment, which is the Chartered Institute of Building Surveyors. And it's an assessment on overheating where it looks at the overheating of the building uh, in its current, the current year, but it also looks at it in the future as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully that will sort of, um, that and as well as looking at the orientation of buildings will help to address the overheating. Okay, so uh, another one is, are there any proposals for neighbourhood scale retrofit on council owned buildings? 
Um, I'm afraid I don't think we. I, yeah. I, yeah, we would have to come back uh, to people on that. Um, again, I think that the Homes Energy uh, project team probably are looking at, uh, at some potential projects, uh, but I haven't got the information to hand. But again, that's something if you go to the council's sort of part of the website on that project, there would be uh, details there. So I think if there are no further questions coming in, we'll probably look to close uh, the webinar and, and just like to thank my colleagues for attending and, and, and for Tim Ball uh, attending as well. Uh, and thank everybody who's, who's watched it online. Thank you for, for watching uh, and submitting your questions. If after this webinar you think, ah, you know, I wish I'd asked a particular question, then uh, please do so. You can send that uh, to the planning policy uh, email address that was shown on the slide in the presentation and, and we'll look to get you a response uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, so I think that will probably close the webinar there. So thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.